I'm delighted this morning to uh, share some of HUD's vision on the future of Opportunity Zones. And also I'm going to announce a new package of incentives that we're unveiling to make it even easier for the private sector to get involved with the Opportunity Zones. But uh, first, I'd like to briefly explain why Opportunity Zones are so important, uh, both to the Trump administration and to the work at HUD. We're proud to be presiding over an incredible period in our history as a nation of tremendous job creation, historic highs in employment, financial growth, and overall optimism, not only in the business community, but in the community at large. Opportunity Zones were created as a result of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act to promote investment into economically neglected areas and to create jobs there also. These incentives allow new investment vehicle called Opportunity Funds to invest the capital gains in projects situated in the neighborhoods in America that really need the most help. Investors can defer and reduce their tax liabilities on capital gains quite dramatically by investing those gains in new construction, in rehabilitation, or in businesses that are expanding in those areas. In some cases, the capital gains tax can be reduced all the way down to zero. And the really key thing that's different about the Opportunity Zone concept and some of the things that have preceded it is the long-term incentive. You know, people have to be there for five, seven, ten years in order to get the major uh, benefits. And of course, if you have to be there for the long run, you're going to be very interested in the return on your investment. So you're not just going to make your investment and walk away. You're going to continue to be interested in what's going on in those neighborhoods. And that means new growth will be consistent growth, new jobs will be persistent jobs, and they will really have a transformative uh, effect on these neighborhoods. Now the result is that the result is that these opportunity zones, this is not a small incremental measure. It represents a major action. And you know, some people have complained about these things. They say it's just a mechanism whereby rich people will get richer again and nothing will happen for poor people. Uh, I'm not sure why this argument comes up with everything in this country. You know, America is probably the last place in the world that we should be having this class warfare argument all the time. You know, you think about, you think about early on when the Europeans complained about America. They said, you got all these rich people like the Vanderbilts and uh, the Rockefellers and the Kelloggs and the Fords and the Vanderbilts and Carnegie's and the Mellons, and then you got all these poor people. You can't run a government like that. You have to have an overarching government that receives all the funding and then equitably redistributes it. Have you ever heard that before? What a bunch of crap. And, uh, but what they didn't realize about America was that unlike you know, the land barons of Europe who just accumulated wealth and passed it down from generation to generation, Wealth in this country was invested in the transcontinental railroad, seaports, textile mills, factories, the mechanisms that created the most powerful and dynamic middle class the world has ever seen. And it didn't stop there. They also created schools, universities, and museums, and all kinds of cultural incentives for people. And it was part of creating the American dream the land of opportunities. And that's why opportunity zones are so important. And we're connecting the opportunity zones also with a revision in section three. Section three of the uh, Fair Housing Act says that if you're getting HUD money, you have an obligation to train, hire, or give contracts 
to the poor people in that area. It's been hardly used because it was so onerous and nobody wanted to deal with it. So we revamped it to take care of that problem. And then you have all the perverse incentives going on in our society, where it's, you're getting housing assistance and you get a raise. You have to report that so that your rent can go up. Or if you bring another income producing person to the household, you have to report that so your rent can go up. And don't even think about getting married. You probably lose your subsidy altogether. Where did this stuff come from? We're in the process of trying to get rid of all of that, fix Section 3, bring opportunity zones to fruition so that we have that capital coming in. This is the way we actually will make a real dent in poverty in this country. And at the same time, people can make money. A win-win situation. Isn't that what government should be doing? It shouldn't be punishing one group at the expense of another. You know, it doesn't make any sense. And at the outset of their creation, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin uh, thought that Opportunity Zones could bring in $100 billion a year. But, uh, you know, it looks like we're well on the way to actually uh, maybe overcoming that amount and going on further than that. For example, the National Council of State Housing Agencies announced last month that its Opportunity Zone Fund directory had expanded to nearly $24 billion in anticipated investments. Of those $24 billion, 91% of the funds plan to invest in multifamily residential, student housing, mixed use, hospitality, or other commercial developments. And nearly 60% of funds plan to invest in affordable and workforce housing or community revitalization. You know, I saw that when I was in Mississippi. Uh, a sawmill that was closing down, it was in an opportunity zone for that reason. Uh, new buyers came in, they thought it was a, a great chance for them to do something. They brought it, they revamped it. Now all those people who were laid off have been rehired and they're building a lot of workforce housing in the area. So you can see the domino effect that it has. This is the kind of thing that we need to be doing for all the neglected areas of our country. Today, nearly 35 million Americans, including 2.4 million HUD-assisted individuals, live in Opportunity Zones, located in all 50 states and the five territories, as well as Washington, D.C. And we regularly hear glowing reports from some of the city officials that anticipated investments in Opportunity Zones have really helped to preserve and attract new economic development in their localities. I was in St. Louis recently and an old foundry that had been abandoned was acting as the nidus for the revitalization. And uh, they were building entertainment, grocery stores, affordable housing, training facilities. It was really quite inspiring. And what was even better is that the governor was there, who was a Republican. The mayor was there, who was a Democrat. One of the congressmen who was a Democrat and people were actually working together. You know, this is something that uh, has bothered me significantly. We need to get rid of all of this Democrat and Republican stuff and start thinking about Americans first. If we think about Americans first and what are good for people, and our system was designed for people to have different opinions, but it was not designed for resistance. You say it's black, I'll say it's white. You say it's tall, I'll say it's small. You know, that doesn't make any sense. And, you know, we've gotten to the point where we act like a bunch of third graders. Apologies to third graders. Now, at, at any rate, you know, data on the online real estate database, Zillow, shows that growth rates for poverty sales prices, property sale prices in selected vulnerable communities, which were from formerly negative, flipped to a positive growth rate of 20% following opportunity zone designation. Further, counties with a larger presence of opportunity zones are showing faster wage growth than those with a similar smaller presence. 
To ensure that Opportunity Zones reach their full potential, last December, the President created the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, uh, which I have the privilege of chairing. And it consists of members across 16 different federal agencies and federal state partnerships. And we have the ability to amalgamate all of our forces with real synergy uh, to concentrate on how to revitalize the economically distressed communities and uh, not working at cross purposes. And we have an executive director who can take uh, feedback from across the nation, integrate it so we have real time progress as we roll these programs out. As of now, the council has identified more than 160 programs that could increase targeting to opportunity zones through things like grant preference points, loan qualifications, reduced fees, and a modification of eligibility criteria. We're also conducting a listening tour of urban, rural, and suburban opportunity zones throughout the nation, listening to the various stakeholders, the leaders, the entrepreneurs, the investors, the people who are being affected. We really want to hear from the people. That's how we're going to make this very successful. And today, I'm delighted to officially announce that the Federal Housing Administration, affectionately known as the FHA, which is actually our largest department at HUD, is unveiling a new package of incentives to encourage multifamily property owners to invest in developments and opportunity zones. FHA is part of the housing division at HUD and maintains an active insurance portfolio of more than, listen to this, $1.3 trillion. Each year helps to uh, finance the homes of more than a million people looking to achieve the American dreams, uh, more than 300,000 affordable rental units for multifamily purposes, and as well as elderly and disabled people. And this new incentive package will be effective today. It has two primary components. First, FHA is significantly reducing the application fees. Um, some people uh, will recognize what the application fees actually are. Sometimes they're called exam fees. Uh, for people who are applying to multifamily mortgage insurance programs for apartment buildings located in opportunity zones. And then secondly, FHA is designating teams of senior underwriters who will be able to review the applications and shepherd them through in a very efficient and effective way. More specifically, applicants to the three FHA multifamily mortgage insurance programs will be eligible for significantly lower application fees. These are the programs that lead to new construction and substantial rehabilitation, urban renewal, concentrated development, and for purchasing and refinancing of existing multifamily properties. And, you know, it, the uh, advantages will accrue basically according to the affordability of the different multifamily projects uh, that are uh, engaged upon. Now, when investors, when more investors can apply for benefits and opportunity zones, then obviously more supply will occur. And uh, that's what this notice is all about. The FHA, FHA will also be designating teams uh, who will be in these places and will be very much available Efficiency is a huge part of what we're trying to achieve. We're doing that at HUD, by the way. Um, we've asked every department to look at what is causing them to be inefficient. Because you can have 10 efficient apartment, departments and one that's not efficient, and it slows down the whole process, regardless of what everybody else has done. We're changing that uh, big time right now. 
And we're motivated by the concerns that we've heard about the speed of the FHA approval process. That's one of the reasons that we're doing this. Now, in the months ahead, we'll continue to listen to the voices of both the housing stakeholders, Americans from every background and all walks of life, so that we can improve opportunity zones for everyone. When the people call America the land of opportunity, they're not simply referring to a slogan. They're describing one of the, the nation's founding beliefs and guiding ideals. Every street in every city, every stretch along every country road has to the power to be a zone where opportunity is found. But you know, we also have an opportunity right now to positively affect our spheres of influence. You know, it's very concerning when we see ourselves being divided as a nation. And I encourage each one of you to use your sphere of influence to help ameliorate that situation. If you're a Democrat, go out of your way today to be nice to a Republican. If you're a Republican, go out of your way to be nice to a Democrat and recognize that what we really want to do is start thinking about how do we create opportunities so that the rising tide floats all boats. And the other thing we need to recognize is that there are principles that guided this nation, godly principles like loving your neighbor, caring for the people around you, developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, of having values and principles that govern our lives. And if we adhere to those principles and don't listen to the haters and to the dividers, then the things that will be possible in this country with the talent that we have here, with the entrepreneurial spirit that we have here, with the innovation that we have here will be unsurpassed and this will truly be a land of opportunity. Thank you very much.